So, so today we're going to continue on with a topic that we've been on called the presence of God. Everybody say the presence of God. And uh, so we're going to move into uh, move into what we've been discussing on the presence of God. And we talked, we started uh, really several weeks ago. And the whole concept of the presence of God is all about the God sized hole that's in everybody's heart that nothing can fill. I mean, I don't know about you, but like, it, it, I mean, I, I, some of you, we got college students in here. And when you, and I know some, uh, some kids that hadn't even gone to college, but like one of the things that I, I said when I was a third grade, I said, if I could just go to OU and play football baby that would be like so amazing God if you could just let me go to OU and play you know with Billy Sims and all them guys way back in the day I grew up down by Tulsa I said man my life would be so amazing well I, that was my dream as a third grader now there are people in this room that you have dreams but when I got to college I didn't go to OU but I got a chance to watch my brother play at OU who was three years older than me and I got a chance to walk in the locker room and see some of the guys that were there and, and seeing their muscles like I said, hey, baby, I got to work out if I want to come play at a place like this. So it inspired me in, anyway, and I wound up coming to the little old bitty Springfield, Missouri, and playing at Missouri State. My point is, is that when the presence of God is on our life, and the presence of God is moving us, that we can go into a new place, a new destiny, a new calling that he has for us that's way bigger than anything that we could ever imagine, I think. So we talked last week about Moses and how it was that Moses was saying to God, listen, if your presence doesn't go up with us, we don't want to go. Like, leave us right where we are. If your presence doesn't take us further, you, you're just going to send us up with your angel. Like, that's not good enough. God, we want you. Everybody say, God, we want you. So there's a, there's a hole in our heart that no amount of, amount of success can fulfill. Even me going to college and playing football, I thought that was fulfilling. That, wouldn't, that didn't do it. I, my beautiful wife, Marcia, of 28 years, she come along and, and, and swept me off my feet, Jan. She, you know what I'm saying? And, and, I, and I said I do to her, and, 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 and my marriage could fulfill a portion of my life, but it couldn't fulfill all of it. I said, hey, baby, when I graduate from college, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go be the president of the company. You know, I'm going to work my way up and I start working my way up and getting, getting raises and getting big titles and getting big positions and getting big salaries and big houses and big cars. And there was never anything that could fill the God size void in my heart. Even, no matter how hard I tried it, 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 it never, it never uh, filled, filled that void. There was no amount of success that could fill the void. My point is, I, I say, hey, 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 baby, when I go into full time ministry, that's going to be it. You know, me having a church and me leading God's people, that will fulfill, that's going to fill this God-sized void in my heart. Guess what? Nothing does. Nothing does. Ministry doesn't. Money doesn't. Titles don't. God, the God-sized hole in our heart, only he can fill that. And he's not going to get second place to anything else. He's not going to say, hey, it's okay if you let your ministry be more important to me. He's never going to say that. He's never going to say to you, hey, it's more important for you to, you know, your wife and your family to take first place over my life. No, 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 no. God's never going to say this. He's always going to be first place. He can never be second. He's God. So the point that we want to focus on today is so how do we pursue that presence? And how do we not only pursue the presence of God, but how do we take, how do we take God's presence, God's presence into the next generation with us. So we're going to go take a look at what happened with Moses and Joshua. So here in the Bible, we find in, in two different places, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we find God and Moses having a conversation. And Amy, they're talking about succession. Now, I will use your name throughout this service. If I know you, your name may be called. If I know your name. But it is a tool for engagement, Tony. It is not that the statement that I'm getting to make, getting ready to make, has something to do with you personally, right? It's just, it's just a part of engagement. So I want to make that declaration up front. If I call your name, you're not in trouble. I mean, it's just a tool for engagement. So, so here we find in, uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, we find uh, Moses and God, they're having a conversation. And the conversation is on succession planning. Everybody say succession planning. So God, what that's a big word. Well, you guys know what it means. Don't you? Like who's going to replace you? 
And Moses and God are having this conversation. The conversation goes something like this. Hey, listen, uh, Moses, you're, you're 120 years old. Uh, you're not going to go in the promised land. I, wanna, I want you to, I want you, God tells Moses, this is the plan. I want you to go get Joshua. And when you go get Joshua, he says, I want you to bring Joshua. I want you to stand Joshua up in front of the people. I want you to have the priest come out before Joshua. And all the millions of people are going to stand out before Joshua. And I want you to make some declarations over Joshua's life. And I want you to inaugurate him. That's where we get inauguration. I want you to inaugurate him so that all the people will know that this is a guy that I'm sending to replace you. And God tells Moses, says, listen, and I'm going to place some of your honor on him. Everybody say honor. So God's got some honor that will cause you to be able to be elevated and be seen and be noticed. It's not through social media. It's not through Facebook. It's not through, what's the other one, Snapchat, Instagram, all that other stuff that they don't allow me to see. My daughters, they don't want dad on it. You know what I'm saying? They don't want dad on it. So he said, it's not through all that stuff. He says, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you honor, but the honor that I'm going to give you is going to cause you to, to, to be elevated. You're going to be noticed. You're going to be seen. So he prays this prayer over Joshua in front of the people. And it says something happened when Moses prayed the prayer and he laid hands on him. He blessed Joshua in front of the people. It says all the people then began to give Joshua honor just like they had given Moses. And today we're going to talk about how do you take the, the, the favor and the presence of God and you move it from your generation into the next generation? And then we're talking about Moses and Joshua are our first examples. So here at Moses and Joshua and, and Deuteronomy, Joshua chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, we find the story picking up that Moses has died. And Moses went up to the mountain and Moses died and said, and God took Moses and God buried Moses and nobody knows where Moses' grave is to this day. But it, it, God's getting ready to do something really special with the children of Israel. And he tells them, listen, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was literally a, a three-foot by three-foot box that had handles on it. It was very precious. It helped the Ten Commandments. It helped some manna so that they could remember that God had fed them in the wilderness. It had a, a rod. It says Aaron's rod that budded. That was a, that was a, a, a tree limb that was cut off that Aaron took it, it, it says that it, it never died even though it was disconnected from the tree the leaves on it were still green it was an almond branch and it produced fruit and he, he says I want you to take Joshua and they're going to take the ark of the covenant he says I'm getting ready to take you into a new destiny a new calling a new place you're getting ready to go in the promised land Moses you won't be able to go but I will allow you to look over so that you can see and it says when Moses first brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and out of bondage it says Moses had a rod everybody say a rod he walked up to the, he walked up, say, Pastor Bobby, why are you so excited about this? He walked up to the Red Sea and he plucked his rod in the Red Sea. And when he plucked the rod in the Red Sea in obedience to what God has said, it says the water obeyed him. The water began to move back out of the way. It says all the water that was flowing down the Red Sea, it stopped flowing. It became a wall. All the rest of the water moved on. And millions of people crossed over on dry ground, not muddy, not soggy, on dry ground. Because Moses' rod went in the ground and it caused, because out of obedience to God. But now we got a new scenario. What's God wanting to do with Joshua? Now they're crossing another place called the Jordan River. They walk up to the Jordan River. God says, listen, I, wanna, I want you to take the priest. And they're going to take the Ark of the Covenant. You go up to the Jordan River, and, and I want the priest to do something for me. He says, I want the priest, I, I, I want you to walk up to the river. And he says, I want the priest to place their feet in the water. Place their feet in the water. You know, there's some risks that's involved in placing your feet in the water, don't you? Like when I was in college, my football coach, I would play defensive end. But this was a, I was a country boy. But like, this was a country boy's country boy. I mean, he was a man's man. It wasn't nothing he was afraid of. He said, boys, we're going to go fishing. Now, I was a pond man. Grew up in Oklahoma, and we had ponds. You know, everybody know what a pond is, right? In Texas, they call them tanks. They ain't from ponds. They're tanks. they tanks. But, but a pond, we had ponds in it. So I would go to a pond, see, that's about big as this, this building. You know why? Because I was impatient. Like I cast around the pond. I go all around about 15 minutes, baby. If no one's biting, guess where I was at, Bucky? Going to the next one. <laughs> I'm moving on. But we went to this river. We went to the river. We're talking risk. And he's like, hey, boys, we're going to go fish in the river. I'll just start, you got my line out. I'll just start fishing. I said, no, no, man, what are you doing? 
Let's go. And he's 20 something. And he's our coach. And we start wading through the river. We get the spots where the water's up to here. And we're holding our fishing poles over our head. And we're going, going down. And I'm looking for spiders and snakes. Like we're walking, we're walking down this river. And we get to the part of the river where it's rocky and shallow. And rocks and everything. And he's like, let's cross over to the other side. Look like we can go down the other side. So I start placing my feet on the rocks of the river. And the force of the water that was moving past me as I was trying to cross, even though I wanted to put my foot here, it would push it there. I didn't realize the force of the water that was moving my feet along. And God tells the, the children of Israel, he says, I want the priest to place that feet in the water. And I know what the priest was thinking. Like, look, guys, that water's moving. Like, God, this is big risk. Like, what does he want? Put <laughs> our feet in the water? What is he? And then, you know, Josh Paul said, hey, let's guys put your feet, put your feet in the water. And they walk up and they put their feet in the water. And when they place their feet in the water, it says God does something. God causes all the water that's flowing from the Jordan River to stop right at the place where they put their feet in the water. It says God built a wall of water right at the Jordan River. And it says that God calls the priests and all the millions of people to walk across on dry ground because they took risks to go in with the presence of God. So here now Moses is gone. It's transitioned on to Joshua and Joshua is the dude and he's taking people into the promised land because God's presence has moved from Moses to Joshua, God's presence. So here's the story. So in Joshua chapter three, verse nine and 10. And so he's telling the people, says, listen, I'm going to do something. John three verse, uh, Joshua three, verse nine he says, come and listen to what the Lord says. He says, today you will know that the living God is among you. Everybody say that the living God is among you. And the way you're going to know it, he says, I'm going to do something. First thing he says, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go after your enemies. Anybody got any enemies? <laughs> you got some, you got some enemies that are natural, but you got some enemies that are supernatural. And God says, there are some supernatural enemies that you got. He calls them here, the Canaanites, the Hevites, the Perizzites, the Gerizites, the Amorites, the Jebusites that are ahead of you. He says, I'm going to drive those out. And he says, I want you to cause the priests to carry the ark and that feet to touch the water. And it says the water flow was cut off. And it says the river will stand still and be like a wall. And it says, and the priest will carry the Ark of the Covenant that stood on dry ground in, in the middle of the riverbed and, and while all the people pass by. So they go out in the middle of the river. They stand still and the water is totally they're on total dry ground. And it says, and they waited until the whole nation. that we got 600,000 men, 600,000 women, 600,000 boy teenagers, 600 600,000 girl teenagers, 600,000 little babies. It's millions of people that are crossing this river because God's presence was with Joshua. And then we go on, we find that the second place that we see God's presence working, that's moved, first place was moving from Moses uh, to Joshua. The second place we see God's presence moving is from Elijah to Elisha. So there are two different people here that we find this in 2 Kings chapter 2. And it says that the, the person Elijah, he was, uh, he was God's man. He he was God's prophet and he was getting ready to die just like Moses was getting ready to die. And it says that uh, 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 the first part of this chapter, it's really amazing because it says that uh, this, this guy Elijah had Elisha following him who was going to be the person that God's presence would move to. And it says they started off and they went to a place called Gilgal. And I don't know about you, but like even from here, it may, it may be like like. A Concordia, like you know, it, it's, it's that far away, but it's actually be northwest of here. If we were in Jerusalem, but it says he he says I want you to go to Gilgal. He says I'm getting ready to go to Gilgal, Elisha. Won't you stay here and I'm going to come back and, and and get you. And Elisha says no, 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 no. You're not going to go to Gilgal. Then he moved to the next place. He moved to the next place, a place called Bethel. He says listen, you stay here in Gilgal. I'm going to go to Bethel. And, and he says no, no, no. I'm my, my God's presence is on you. I'm going with you. Then he goes to the next place called Jericho. And when he gets to Jericho. Jericho, it says the prophets that were in Jericho, they came out to meet him. They said, hey, 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 Elisha, do you know that Elijah's getting ready to die? God showed us his prophets. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, I know it. And it says, and Elisha, Elijah went to the Jordan River now and he took his mantle off his neck, a, a mantle that hung around his neck. He folded it over and it said he struck the Jordan River. And when he struck the Jordan River, the waters parted. 
And Elijah and Elisha walked across on dry ground. So we find the story picking up here in 2 Kings chapter 9, chapter 2, verse 9. It says, it's when it came to the other side, Elisha, that crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. He, he says, tell me what I can do for you. Talking to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. It's like, I'm telling you, I'm getting ready to leave. Succession. I'm getting ready to leave. And Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and before, become, and before and become your successor. So it says, you have asked a difficult thing. But Elijah said unto him, if you see me when I'm taking, taking from you, says, then you will get the request that you ask, uh, that you want. I love it because many times we say, hey, Elisha had to catch his mantle. He had to catch the mantle for him to get the presence of God on his life. And, and Elijah made it easy. Say, listen, man. If you see me, see me. Everybody say, see me. If you see me taken away, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause God that request that you had to come, come to pass. And it goes on to say this in verse 11 and 12. It says, as they were walking along and talking, suddenly in the sky, a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses, and it drove, and it drove between the two men and separated them. And Elisha was carried up in the world one of heaven. And it says, and Elisha saw it, and he cried out, my father, my father. And he says, I see the chariots, I see the chariots of Israel. And it says, and they disappeared in the sight of Elisha. And Elisha tore his garments because he was in mourning, because his father in the ministry had been taken away from him. And then it says, Elisha does something. Now he's mad. He's crossed the Jordan River. And it says when he crossed the Jordan River, I left some of it out so we wouldn't be here all day. It says there was 50 prophets that were looking at this whole thing happen. He turned around and he went back across the Jordan River. And look at what he cried out. He says he, he took Elijah's mantle or his cloak and that had fallen. He taken it and he says, and Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. And when he gets to the bank of the Jordan River, what does he do? He takes that cloak and he cries out and he smacks the Jordan River. And he says, where is the God of Elijah? He didn't ask for Elijah back. He said, where is the God of Elijah? Like if, if God was in Elijah's life, can, can he be in, a, in my life, Elisha? It says when he struck the Jordan River, the Jordan River parted just as it did. Just as it did for Elisha. And it says he walked across on dry ground just like Elisha did. And he gets over the other side of Jordan River. The first city he goes into is a city called Jericho. He goes to Jericho and the people of Jericho come out to him and say, hey, 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 hey. We see, we said, seen you smack the Jordan River. And he, we seen like you walk across on dry ground just like Elijah did. Will you come to our city? There's something going on in our city. The water in our city is bitter. The water in our city, we can't drink it. It's killing people. Can you come help us? So he goes to the city and, and just to demonstrate God's power on his life, he takes a, a, a like a vase and he puts salt and put a little water in it. And he puts it in the well or the spring where the water for the city was drawn from. And it says the water immediately became good water and it stopped the curse and it caused the water in that city to be blessed. And it says he goes on from there. He's demonstrating the authority and the presence of God on his life. He goes on up from there and he's going back to Gilgal where they had started started this journey from and it says as he's going up some little kids came out and started yelling at him making fun of him because because he's a bald-headed guy that ain't right you know what i'm saying <laughs> he's a bald-headed guy the kids start started making fun of him and you know he didn't like have much grace he turned around and looked at the kids and says hey hey you kids i'm cursing you he turned around and walked off and when he turned around and walked off two female bears came out and killed the kid this in your Bible. This is a prophet of God. But what was he demonstrating? He was demonstrating the ability for God's presence to bless you and God's presence to curse you. He was demonstrating God's power. So what, what's the point here? That we have a God that's looking down on us. He wants to allow his presence to rest on us. So no matter where that we go, we can change the conditions. We can change the circumstances that we walk into. He didn't want us to walk in the city and leave the city the same way we found it. He didn't want us to move in a region and leave the region the same way we found it. Say, hey, no, no, no. We're not going to. We're just going to keep allowing that to happen. He wants us to be transformers. What? So he takes us to the New Testament. We go over to Matthew chapter 6. Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. 
He says to the disciples, says, <laughs> I says, I don't want you to be like the people that pray, standing in the synagogues and street corners and doing all those things. He said, when you pray, I want you to pray this prayer. Everybody say it with me, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we see the presence of God, the presence of God being fulfilled in these verses. That last week we talked about Jesus when he came to earth. He prophesied, he opened up, up in the temple, he opened the Bible, he began to read from Isaiah chapter 61. He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to bring the good news or preach the good news of the gospel. How many of you know there's no better good news than you to know that you have an eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ? That there's no, <laughs> there's no sin that's more powerful than the blood of Jesus. That's the good news. He says, I'm, I'm come to give you that good news. I don't care what it is you've done. I don't care what the world tells you that you're going to go to hell for. There's no sin more powerful than my blood. And I'm the good news. I'm coming that to bring you back into God's family. That's the that's good news. He goes on to talk about him. I'm going to set the captives free. But here in John, we see Jesus coming to the, to the River Jordan. And we're back to the River Jordan three times in one service. How about that? We started off with Moses and Joshua. Then we went there with Elijah and Elisha. Now we're here with John the Baptist and Jesus. We right back to the same spot. Me and Marcia, we went to the Jordan River. We been married 28 years, but 13 years ago for our 15th wedding anniversary, we, we took a tour day Israel. <laughs> we go to Israel. One of the spots that we see go to in Israel is the Jordan River. So you go to Jordan River, they got locker rooms, they got walking paths, they got all this kind of stuff there. But you can actually be baptized in the Jordan River. And we go to the Jordan River uh, to be baptized. So we go there to be, be baptized. And I'm going to get back on Jesus here in just a second. But we go to be baptized. And uh, Marcia, you know, they, they kind of take everybody in our group, like 10 of us. And they go one by one. Guess who went last? You see why, don't you? <laughs> and <laughs> I'll be laughing, but the tour group, the tour group, the lady that took it, we went with a husband and wife, and they've been in ministry like 40 years. So they were in no shape to be baptizing me, man. Like, I, I mean, but, but when you baptize, you got to have a little bicep. I mean, so you got to have something to kind of get people back up. But they had a trick that they used. <laughs> they had a trick that they used, Lindsay. So, so they, 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 uh, they got me. I was like a tree falling. <laughs> and I was like a tree, baby. They got me started back, and then they just got out of the way. And that, boom. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they just let me hit bottom and stand back. I'll say, bless the Lord. You've been baptized in the Jordan River. <laughs> and I said, right. I, I basically baptized myself because you, you couldn't pick me up. I mean, but <laughs> so now I ain't talking about the camel. <laughs> she's like, hey, that was one spot. We went to look Mount Zion to overlook Jerusalem and looking at the dome of the rock. But you could take a picture like you climb upon the camel. Rock, you just, I'm trying to preach here. <laughs> but you could take a, you, could, you can kind of mount up on the camel. So his head is here. You can kind of mount up on the camel and, you know, kind of straddle him and like have the dome of the rock and a photographer guy in your group take a picture with the dome of the, dome of the rock kind of back behind you. So, so again, here you go. I tell them I ain't getting on that camel. I mean, elephants and heights don't go together. It's like I ain't getting on the camel. And I say, you better pass the ball. You need, to buy. but brother Bobby back in. You need to get on the camel. So I go to throw my foot, foot on the camel, and he turns around, <laughs> tries to bite me. It's like, hey man, I seen guys your size, and I can't stand up with them, so I ain't even letting you get on. <laughs> I said, and I, so, so Marcia got me back on that one. Like, so that was my sign to leave the camel alone. Don't, don't mess with the camel. I mean, period. So here we see the third place, the third place that we see, the third place that we see, uh, the presence of God, third place that we see the presence of God, promise no more Israel stories. The third place that we see the presence of God moving from, from really from the Father in heaven to a person that's here on earth, heaven coming to earth. God's kingdom coming, God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven happens right here at the Jordan River, and it's with Jesus. So in John chapter 1, verse 28, it says this, And this encounter took place at Bethany in the area east of Jordan River where John the Baptist was baptizing. So there's John the Baptist, he's baptizing at the Jordan River. 
And it says, the next day, the next day, uh, it says, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away all the sin of the world. He says, he is the one that should, who I was talking about, who I said, a man coming after me is, is greater than I am. He says, uh, it, for he existed long before me, saying that Jesus created all things. And it goes on to say, it says, I did not recognize him as Messiah or the Savior that should come. It says, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might uh, be revealed here on earth. And John testifies, says, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting on him. So when we see Jesus come to earth and see Jesus ministry really kick off at age 30, it happened when the presence of God came like a dove and rested on him so that he could go into the destiny that God called him to. He could go into the destiny God called him to. So what's God's word for us as a church today? And what's God's word for you? Like, what's God's destiny for your life? What were you created for? I read a testimony. Somebody said, listen, I almost died three times. I know God's got a calling for me. I can begin to tell you some stories of, of my commutes back and forth from Mobile to Slater over seven year periods, over seven year period, all the near death experiences I had on the road. And how the presence of God and me praying in the spirit caused me, my life, to be spared. I had one instance where just out of nowhere, I just began to pray in the spirit. Just praying and just using my heavenly language right in the spirit. And I go around this curve and some person, I must have just got off work. It's probably five o'clock in the morning. I go around the curve and that person's in my lane going around the curve, blind to him. And I have to go in a ditch to spare my life. Another time I was going home and a road was like a sheet of ice. My wife comes and said, hey, do you know the weather's getting bad? The weather's getting bad. You need to get on, you need to get on the road. Get home. You coming home? You coming home? I was like, well, I, woman, I come on. I got work to do. I ain't got time to come. I ain't got time. So I, <laughs> I got started home, Johnny. Oh, my goodness. I said, I'm eating crow today, baby. My knuckles, I mean, these are brown knuckles, but they were white then. Hey. <laughs> Hey, these knuckles were white. I mean, it was like, it was like a sheet of ice. And so I'm going down the road and I see these cars coming. And, and, and my car with these average ice like creeping along, like barely going. But my car, without me even trying to, I'm trying to be, like just keep it right in my life, slides off the road into the oncoming traffic and down an embankment. My life was spared. Because God had a destiny for me. I'm coming, coming to work one morning. I go through Gillum. I'm going up over the hill and a dove comes and flies and lands right in the middle of the road. You know, I'm kind of past compassion about animals. You know, I'll honk and swerve and do everything I can to kind of keep from running over them. And a, a dove comes and lands right in my lane in the middle of the road. I'm like, just almost I had to stop in the middle of the road. I go up over the hill. There's a guy that's a cable person that had his, his ladder. To go up on, uh, put install cable, it fell out in the middle of the road, and this dude was standing right out in the middle of the road. God's presence. Like, how do you explain stuff like that? So the question becomes, what's God's presence for you? What's God's plan for you? Like, what is God trying to do? If the dove hadn't landed in my lane, and I'm doing 85 and a 25 like I normally do, somebody would have had a funeral. But the dove landed in my lane. Let's stand to our feet. Let's ask God, what is, what is, what is his will? What's his, his plan for our life? Because he's got a great one for you. So, Father, I bless these, your people. I thank you so much, God, that you do have a plan for their life, that your presence is taking them someplace, that you've got a promised land experience for them, that you're trying to get them into. God, I thank you that you're, you're causing uh, them to be like uh, Joshua and Moses. Like you've got a, you've got a, a crossing uh, that you're, you're taking them across for them to go into the destiny that you have for them. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm praying for every single person under the sound of my voice that has been stuck in the wilderness. And I say to you that today is your day, that God's presence is here for you to experience that you can cross into the destiny, into the calling, into the plan that God has for your life. I want you to be like Elijah and Elisha. That God will cause a double portion of his presence to rest on you. That you'd be able to do great and mighty exploits in your life. 
that you would be able to shift and to change regions, that you'd be able to bring blessings to your city, blessings to your family, that you cause God would use you to do great and mighty things and that God would do to you for, for you what he done for Jesus, that he would allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to rest on you so that you could go out and do great and mighty things. You could transform environments. Jesus says, the works that I do, greater works than you, you're going to do because I'm going to the Father. So my prayer for you today is that you would be able to receive this person of the Holy Spirit so that you can go do great things like Jesus said. Jesus said, I come to preach the good news to the poor. And I, I just thank you, God, that you're causing each one of us to be a witness for you today. Jesus says, I've come to set the captives free. I just pray, God, you just cause us to walk into every environment that we go into and we'd be able to shift and to change those environments. The main thing that God wants you to know today, that, that good news that Jesus came and died for you is available for you today. Like you don't have to keep living the same life that you've been living, thinking that God doesn't love you, that God couldn't forgive you, that no way God could give you another chance. Let me tell you something, that Jesus took all the sins of the world upon himself and he can take your sins too. I used to categorize Jesus and I say, hey God, I'm not going to bother you with my little problems because you've got more problems that, to solve in the world than, than mine. I try to, try to limit God's ability because God is infinite in his power. He's infinite. There's no stopping God. Like God's love for you is tremendous. The Bible says neither height nor depth nor principality of power, nothing can separate us from, God, from God's love. So God's love is here for you today. God sent his son as a demonstration of his love for you. And he wants you to come to know him today. So this is your moment. This is your season. But God's presence is going to take you into a new place spiritually. God's presence is going to take you in a new place in your family, and your finances. God's presence is here for you right now, and he wants you to come, to know, come into his family. This is not about you becoming a member of Life Church. This is about a personal decision you're making to invite the King of kings and the Lord of lords into your world, the Savior to save you and to transform your world. He's here for you. He's here for you. He's here for you. So for those in this room that you already know Jesus, I want you to pray with me for that person that doesn't know Jesus. That today they can cross into the promised land because you prayed. So Father, I'm praying that you would extend your presence now. It says no one comes to me except the Father draw them. So Lord, I just thank you that you're drawing the people in this room to yourself. So on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands. And when you raise your hands, Jesus is going to come into your heart. He's going to cause your life to be transformed. You're going to raise your hands and we're just going to pray a prayer together. One, two, three. Just go ahead and raise your hands up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hey, he's here for you. Don't leave this place. Don't leave this place the same way. He's here for you. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. Just say yes to him. Just say yes to him. His love is so significant. His grace is so significant. He's forgiven you. Thank you so much. I see hands still going up. Hands still going up. Thank you, God. You put your hands down. Let's pray this prayer together. Everybody repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for paying the price for my sins. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for giving me eternal life through the blood that you shed for me on the cross. Thank you for welcoming me into your family. I receive you now transform my life make all things new and with every head bowed and every eye closed we just want to pray another prayer for you that uh, that today is a momentum uh, it's a spiritual shift for us as a church uh, that God has taken us into a new season a new destiny a new calling and uh, as a church and God is shifting us as individuals like the place that he's taken us to of the things that he's promised and he's spoken over a women's event for 2020. Unbelievable. Like, we, we won't be able to do it with normal, natural efforts that we've been doing. So God is doing a shift spiritually for us as a church. It's just his favor. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. 
It's just God's goodness that he's pouring out on us. And that happens when um, people that he's preordained from the foundation of the earth come together for him. And regardless of our feelings for one another, we've placed those aside and we place him first and he can do something with that. And so what God is doing is he's taking us into a new destiny, a new calling as a church, and he's taking you into a new destiny, a new calling today. I'm, I release the word of God, which is the Ark of the Covenant, to shed off the river so that we can move as, a, as everybody in this room and everybody watching online, we can move into the promised land together. So if that's you, you said, hey, listen, man, I've been in a wilderness long enough. I've been doing things my own way long enough. I've been trying things my own way long enough. Success ain't doing it. My business ain't doing it. My family ain't doing it. My marriage's not doing it. I've been doing everything myself long enough. I want to pray for you that God can move you into the destiny that he has for you. Maybe you had a dream like me. Hey, I want to go to college and play football. Maybe you got a career dream. Whatever those things are that you've been trying, striving, trying to do things on your own that's not working, God's here for you today and he wants to bless you. So just in a posture of receiving, would you just open your hands and face them upward, please? Let's open your palms, just face them upward. And when we open our hands and we face them up, we're going to ask just God's presence to come. And God's going to transform our situation. He's going to take us in from the wilderness into the promised land. You don't have to do it. You can stay in the wilderness if you want to. But today is your day to move into the promised land that God has for you. To move into the destiny and the calling that God has for you. I mean, you, 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 can, you can stay with the same amount of power and, and uh, ability that you've always had. But you want to be like a lash. Ask for a double portion. God wants to do that for you today. God wants to do that for you today. Just receive it. Just receive it. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying for every single one of these people under the sound of my voice. We want all that you have for us. We want your presence. We want your goodness. We want your mercy. We want your grace. We want your compassion. We want your favor to rest on us. So, Father, I pray today that you would move us into the promised land that you have for us. Move us into the destiny and the calling that you have for us. Move us into that place of love that you have for us. God, move us into that place of surrender that we've not been able to accomplish on our own. God, we just come to you and we say we want more of you. More of you. Whatever you have for us, God, we want it. Whatever you have for us is better than what we could do by ourselves. God, give us the ability to take risks with you. Even though the water's moving and it looks, it's looked the torn and strong, God, give us the ability to place our feet in the water and take that step of faith with you, to move out with you, to move out with you, to know when we are obedient to you, you're going to cause that water to stop. You're going to cause each one of us to move into the promised land that you have for us. So we receive that now, God. And for those of you watching online, just receive his presence. God, I release your blessing over these, your people. I thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Cover them as only you can. Transform and make all lives new from this moment on. Cause us to walk into the destiny that you have for us. We thank you, God, for your presence going with us. We expect great things to happen from this day forward, God. We expect you to transform our world, to transform our lives, to cause our church and our community to be transformed. God, to cause this region to be transformed because they've seen the presence of God before us. We thank you, God, that you're driving out all of our enemies, all of those who oppose your work in our life, the thing, the destiny, the calling, your will for our life, the enemy not seen, but the enemies that are unseen. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rules and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We thank you, God, that you're driving out every enemy that's trying to keep us from the destiny that you have for us. So we receive your goodness today. Everybody repeat after me. Father God, we receive your grace, your mercy, your compassion, your love, your favor, and your presence. We want your presence. Go before us. Make the way straight for us. In Jesus' mighty name.